We have all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richard Dell, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome back to The Converging Zone. We have Ted Haggard with us for session number three. Ted? Yes, sir. Good to have you. We've Thank been, you. We've been uh, touching on a lot of things. Yeah. You know, this last session we talked about about hierarchy of sin. We've, 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 you know, when the, in the sixties, it was the big thing was divorce. And if you were divorced divorce and remarried, divorce and remarriage, right, right. that was unpardonable. Yeah, that, that was the sin because of what Jesus said. It, it's perpetual adultery wow. if you're divorced and remarried in with a few exceptions. So that was a common theme taught in the churches throughout America prior to the eighties. We, I met a pastor and not, not anywhere now though. Yeah, I met a pastor one time because I'm one of those divorced and remarried, mm -hmm. Joyce and I. I met a pastor one time at, that was a friend, and he went, I don't know how he stumbled upon this, but he made it very clear to us that my wife and I, Joyce and I, were living in perpetual adultery. Mm -hmm. and, and he, in fact, went on to create divorces of people who had been married because in, if, they, if they didn't divorce, then they and then they were gonna they were gonna go to hell. Yeah. So he actually sanctioned divorces of healthy marriages because of this doctrine. Yeah, it gets confusing, and I I try to, you know, and none of us can do it. We have to be responsible for ourselves, and we have to work what goes on in our lives with the scriptures and with the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the body of believers, yeah. so that we can all be healthy. And so it's a wonderful thing not to have to judge all the brethren. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing not to even have to have an opinion about it. So regularly, I'll have people come up and they'll say, what do you think of Benny Hinn? Or what do you think of this person? Or what do you think of that person? And I just say, actually, I don't have an opinion about that. <laughs> and it's so wonderful yeah. not to have to have an opinion. Benny Hinn doesn't work for me. Yeah. You know? And yeah. if I was talking to him, I'd encourage him. Yeah. You know, because that's my role. I'm you not as God. Life. I'm not as God. I'm not as Bible. Yeah. I'm not the press trying to gossip about him. Yeah. I'm not the devil. I'm not his accuser. And so I'm a brother. Yeah. And so, and so as he works through issues in his life or whatever or anybody, I don't have to have an opinion about all that unless they're in our church or in my family. And so that is where chain of command is important. I, I, I was here in San Diego one time. It, um, a pastor here in town had written a blog against somebody, but that somebody was not in his church. And so Larry King had that person and this pastor on air. And Larry was going through, he was contemplating his seventh divorce right then. Mm. Okay, so the pastor had given his opinion, and then the other person was the appointed sinner for the day, and then Larry King was working on number seven, and of course, I'm the chiefest of sinners, yeah. okay? And so, as he pointed his finger, I said, just said, Pastor, why would you do this? She doesn't claim to be in your church. She doesn't, it's none of your business. Yeah. Leave her alone. Yeah. And if you wanna have concern about that, let it be in the prayer closet. Yeah. And so I think every one of us have to just settle those issues. Yeah, and if you don't have a, where, a place to even speak life or into the situation, it really isn't of your concern. You have no relationship with that person. Yeah, yeah. We aren't each other's gods. Yeah. Jesus is Lord. God the Father is God the Father. The Holy Spirit does a fine job. So I don't have to convict you of your sin. Yeah. I don't have to instruct you and correct you. Yeah. But I do have to be your advocate yeah. and encourager, yeah. and I have to be your brother. Yeah, and if I was in your church, you'd come alongside me and say, hey, Rob, let's right. work on some of these things. Because there's permission there. Yeah. There's permi when you've agreed to go to a church, then you've, you've given permission to the leadership to, to talk with you. Yeah, yeah. You know? And it's always meant to lift up. Yeah, like I read down. all the time because of my scandal in 2006, all the time people will say, Ted Haggard shouldn't be in ministry, but they live in Vermont or they live in Hawaii or yeah. they live in Minnesota. Yeah. So they're not contemplating coming to my yeah. church. All right, so the people that are coming to St. James 
have chosen yeah. that I can be in ministry. Yeah. The guy in Vermont, I mean, I'm a Protestant evangelical, spirit-filled evangelical. Yeah. I do not have an opinion about how the Mormon chooses, Mormons choose their leadership. Yeah. Okay. I live in Colorado Springs. I do not have an opinion how the bishop appoints priests in the local parishes. Yeah. It's none of my business. It's not your business. Okay. No more is it, is it my business to run those churches than a guy in Vermont saying Ted Haggard shouldn't be in ministry. It has nothing. I haven't asked him for money. Yeah. I haven't asked him for an endorsement, and he's not going to come to my church. And you have no relationship so with this person. So he's just being arrogant. Yeah. See. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's the number one thing. See, we've got to deal with an or It's one of the major things we have to deal with in evangelicalism. We are just not everybody's God. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember several years ago when one of our major televangelists said the hurricane hit Miami because the gays are there? Yeah, I've heard Remember that. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, th I, I mean, I've known, uh, I've, a city's a city. Yeah. It's true there are gays there, but there are also homeschoolers there. Yeah. Maybe the hurricane hit Miami because those homeschoolers were messing up. Exactly. It's stupid. Same thing with Katrina. They said that God judged America when Katrina it, hit. And, you know, I said, well, then God has bad aim because he missed the whole French quarters. Because he it, didn't <laughs> yeah, you can't even get into that. That's Old Testament. Yeah. It's pre-cross. Okay, the cross separated people from their sins. Yeah. All right, now, some will receive that fact and others won't. Yeah. But the cross separated people from their sins. Mm. All right, so if people want to live in the Old Testament, that's, that's retro 3,000 years. Yeah. Okay, but we are new Testament believers. Yeah. And here's how reasonable that kind of thinking is. We just went through an election season with Romney and uh, President Obama. Okay, I was disgusted with those guys. <laughs> Absolutely disgusted, because none of them talked about the importance of us being free from the monarchy in London. Mm. None of them said, Queen Elizabeth, we need to make sure we're free from her. None yeah. of them said that. Okay, so you tell me, if President Obama came here to San Diego and was having a speech and he said, we're against the monarchy. We want to be self-governing people. We need to rise up and ensure that Prince Harry and Prince William are never respected in our country. Yeah. We would all look at them like, what is your deal? Yeah. The Revolutionary War was 200 years ago. That's true. We settled the issues between us and the king yeah. 200 years ago. It's irrelevant to this election, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's the same when New Testament Christians look at the Old Testament law and try to let that form their worldview. Isn't that something? It's a, it's, it, we can gain wisdom from the Old Testament. Yeah. We can gain insight from the stories. But that Torah is not ours. No, it's not. It did not work. It even says it's obsolete. It's obsolete. Yep. The Bible says, the New Testament yep. says. And so, but you see, if we're like, <clears throat> I read a one, one year Bible every day. I read Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. Every day I read it. But if people aren't sophisticated in their understanding, they will assume the Old Testament scripture has the same authority in their lives as 21st century Christians as the New Testament scripture. But it doesn't. The Old Testament is an obsolete failure. We can learn some things from it, but it is not the New Testament to us, that we are living in a new and better way. If we don't make that transition, we will amalgamate the Old Testament law and New Testament grace, and we will create a new religion, which is, I think, where most churches are. Is this where, how we got into this denominational thing? That, no, that no, is, no. That's divided? It's not denominationalism. It is the culture of modern evangelicalism right now. It's an the amalgamation it's an, uh, of evangelicalism. Yeah. It's an amalgamation of Old Testament law, New Testament grace, and it's created a new religion that really isn't New Testament yeah. Christianity, which is why, which is why uh, they'll so freely kick out a staff member that they're not satisfied with, even though they'll preach on Sundays, we're a family of God, 
we're the building of the Lord, we're brothers and sisters, but then when somebody does something that isn't acceptable, they're gone, and then we cover it over on Sunday. Wow. See, and, and but the rationale for that can't be found in the New Testament. It, with one exception, 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the unrepentant brother. All right, but... Well, uh, he was supposed to even be set for restoration. Yeah, in first Corinthians, or yeah. Second Corinthians, it says, bring him back. Yeah. Because he's caused an, the, the, the pain is, will be too much for him, and he'll grieve too deeply. And so New Testament is restoration, healing, kindness, uh, uh, redemption. And uh, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, here's what Barclay says. In the Old Testament, God is a judge and mankind are criminals. Mm. In the New Testament, God is a loving father and mankind are his children. Mm. Let's talk about this external we're trying to use external ways yeah. to create morality. Like accountability groups. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or whatever. Or and just how fru- it's manipulation. unfruitful. It doesn't work. It doesn't because work. It, you, uh, just because a man isn't committing adultery doesn't mean he's not an adulterer. Because mm. Jesus says it's about the heart. It's about the heart. Okay, so uh, um, externally imposed morality is not morality at all. Mm. That's good. Externally imposed virtue is not virtue at all. So you can take an adulterer and put him in a burqa under the threat of law, and they won't commit adultery, but they are an adulterer. Mm. See, yeah. Jesus is, is, the New Testament is not external control, behavioral modification. Yeah. The New Testament is internal transformation and new creation. So we actually become different. We become a new Which creation. affects the outside. So it's the in f- yeah. that affects the outside right. versus looking at the outside to affect the inside. Right. And see, see, so what we do is we take that argument, though, and we say, oh, well, if somebody sinned, then that means they're not a genuine Christian. That is not true. Yeah. Every genuine Christian sins. Yeah. We are simultaneously saints and sinners. We want to grow in our sainthood. Yeah. We want the Holy Spirit to work out it diminish yeah. the the control. We have no obligation Which to Which is sin. what they, I think, is in essence, what they're saying, the working out your salvation isn't working out your eternal salvation. It's working out your salvation of, of progressing from, from, saint, from a sinner to yeah. more of a We call saint. it progressive sanctification. Pro- pro- progressive sanctification. Yeah, and so, and, and that is exactly right. And that is a wonderful process, and it's not bad. So, if somebody says something wrong or does something wrong, we in our simplistic thinking would think that's a reflection of their character. That's not necessarily the case. Mm. Actually, every addict I know, and by the way, right now, they're saying 40% of the college gradu- male college graduates graduating right now in America, 40% of them are sex addicts. Mm. All right, so a large percentage of them will be wonderful Christian young men that hate the addiction until they love it. Then they do it. Then they go to remorse. They repent again. And then, I mean, every addict I know of has repented of their addiction hundreds of times. All right? So their addiction is not a reflection of their character. Their addiction is a reflection of their humanity. Yeah. It's the human condition. And so we shouldn't have condemning judgmentalism about that. Yep. and condemn them or put them out or diminish, demean them or dehumanize them. We need to embrace them and heal them. Well, this comes down to, first of all, sin management doesn't work. Secondly, what I found is if someone who is so conscious of how bad they are, mm-hmm. it actually perpetuates more of that activity. Of the bad behavior, versus, that's versus, right. Versus, I've talked to race car drivers, they say, I said, what about the wall? They go, we don't focus on the wall. If we right. focus on the wall, we're going to hit the wall. Right. We focus on navigating the turn. So people who are so sin-focused, sin-conscious, yeah. they will sin more. The Apostle Paul is perfectly clear about this. Yeah. The Apostle Paul talks about this vision of eternity before us, 
and how that is to be our motivation and our guide. And in the, in, and in the Bible, he also talks about, there's this sin in my life. And I, I mean, think about the Apostle Paul. He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, he talks about this sin that's in his life. So he does things that he doesn't want to do. In Romans eight, all he says is there's no condemnation. He doesn't say the problem, the problem is solved yep. fully. Okay, but think about this. Here he calls himself the chiefest of sinners. He calls himself the least of the apostles. He, he calls, he, he's very, very clear about his human condition being frail. He, he says his own righteousness is as filthy rags. Yep. All right, and he's very, very clear how we march toward the goal for the high calling yes, of Christ. Yep. We have no obligation to sin, although sin is still there. Yeah. And uh, we can be okay. We can grow yeah. unless we start biting and devouring one another. If we start biting and devouring one another, everybody loses. So basically what he's saying is, I'm not okay and it's okay. Nobody's okay. That's true. All right, Noah. Noah yeah. saved the world. And then he was in the tent by himself, naked and drunk. What in the world was going on in there? Wow. Okay. But he saved the world. Yeah. Okay. David, I mean, my gosh, he's the man after God's heart. But he used his power to commit murder and then cover it up. Yeah. And I mean, talk about a mess. The Bible's filled with these, these stories. All of them. All of them. With the exception of Jesus. Except Jesus. Every one of them are notable sinners. Mm. that God used in a mighty way. And that's why, that's why the people God uses are very aware of their own human condition. Yeah. And they're very aware of the redemption of Christ, the, uh, the righteousness of Christ. If people become uh, dominated by their self-righteousness, yeah. they're not Christians. Yeah, and this because is where the Pharisees come in. They're a Pharisee. And so a Christian is a person who, who believes and practices that Jesus is their righteous. I shouldn't say practices. Believes Jesus is their righteousness. It's in their being. And it's evidenced by whether or not they're judgmental. Wow. If they believe, I said this a couple shows ago, if they believe Jesus is their righteousness, they will be kind, merciful, healing, and redemptive. They'll see another sin as an opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ. Okay, if they are self-righteous, if they think they're pretty good or they think they've achieved, yeah, they've to it. whatever measure they are self-righteous is the measure that they will be condemning in their judgmentalism. So if, so if they kind of put their chest out and they say, well, we wouldn't do that around here, they're not Christians. Yeah, Because wow. to be a Christian, it does to be a Christian means Christ is your righteousness. See, so, so the church is the church is the gathering together of the gratefully redeemed. Yeah. The the uh, modern church that is going through its difficulties right now, it might be the gathering of the self righteous. Wow. And that's where we're going against. You know, talking about that, let's 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 move into this. You've started, and I'm really excited about this, by the way, and I'm going to be a part of this, these roundtables. Yeah. And you've been coming in uh, recently. You're in Minneapolis. Yeah. Talk about what God put on your heart, and now he's put on a lot of our hearts, uh, how much we need to have this in our cities okay. and gathers. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, there are leadership meetings. So, so you have to be a leader. Yeah. All right. And we discuss, we don't record anything. We discuss the 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 misreading or the misemphasis in the Bible that has resulted in us being perceived as being a hate group. And we discuss then New Testament theologies that we can start emphasizing so that we can be authentic. And it's amazing because um, uh, pe people... Uh, I had two guys from the Minneapolis Roundtable, two very successful pastors of big churches, say they learned more about the gospel 
in the 24-hour roundtable than they had in the previous um, the, in the previous 20 years. And and so so what we're doing is we're working with the hard subjects. Yeah. So and we want to kind of wrestle with it. And you're actually having people read a book like The Shack or some of these other books like The Naked Gospel. Yeah. That are you trying by reading that book are you trying to get their mindset outside of of their maybe some of their presuppositions? Exactly. We've got to become an authentic New Testament churches. All over America, we have evidence that we're not grasping the New Testament church. Mm. And we divide, we separate, we are exclusive, yeah. we dismiss people. We, we become we, irrelevant. See, yeah, think of this. The Old Testament says God hates divorce. Yeah. All right, so we know that's a moral truth. Right. Okay. And so, so we'll say to people, you must not divorce your husband. You must not divorce your wife. You, God hates divorce. We're strong on that, right? Yeah. But we divorce people in our churches all the time. Yeah. We divorce the youth pastor. We divorce the secretary. We divorce this person. Yeah. So it's a corporation. It's not a church. Yeah. It's just, here's what I call it, a God corporation. Yeah. We sell God products. Wow. So in the, on Merchandising. The, in, so in the pulpit, we'll say, we're a family until we don't like something, then we're not a family, you yeah. gotta go. What happens See? when people leave? If, when your sons go off to college, they're still your sons. When still your daughter sons. goes, and, and when, we and, communicate and, with and, them. Okay, and they're family. When someone leaves a local church, I've seen people move to, to another part of the city or leave a church, mm -hmm. literally that family unit or that relationship they once had with that pastor is no longer. Yeah, which is crazy. Because it never was family. It, it, see, and it may be a hyper emphasis on the difference between clergy and laity. Mm. And it's definitely a tradition that we've created about um, delegated spiritual authority. Because, mm. see, essentially, we created a whole bunch of little popes. Yeah. We're Protestants. We said, as Protestants, we said, we can read the Bible on our own. We can pray to God directly. And then we went along with that Protestantism. It was wonderful. So we didn't need a pope and we didn't need a priest. Jesus was our priest. Yeah. Okay. Then we got into the 20th century and we had an emphasis on delegated spiritual authority. And all of a sudden, people at the top of the chain of command, which we needed for order, became a spiritual authority. They became Christ's voice. And we essentially ended up with thousands of of popes. Middle managers. It's a disaster. No, they're, they're, <laughs> they become they're dictators. Dicta wow. Tyrants and in some they're cases. They're tyrants. And because they actually believe, they're not deceptive, they actually believe that their opinions and their thoughts and their voice is the voice of God. It couldn't be more dangerous because the best a human can be is a brother. Yeah. Fulfilling the role of a pastor or an elder. Yes. Okay. But a pastor is not the shepherd. Yeah. There is only one shepherd. I love that. And that is Jesus. The pastor, if the pastor believes he's a shepherd, he will subliminally train his congregation to hear his voice. And to follow him. And to follow him. If he believes he is in this role by God's grace, but there is one shepherd and that is Jesus. Yeah and he is the head of the church, then he will teach the people to hear Jesus' voice. His voice. The Holy Spirit. Wow. Okay? And see, see now, I believe there's delegated spiritual yeah. authority, but we've made a hyper emphasis on it, yeah. and all the wrong people capitalized on that, and they use it for, remember last, yeah. the, the last show? They use it for, uh, to make sure people are submitted, yep. and make sure people are... Um, Let's see, it's submission and obedience. Back to that external it, controls again. Submission and obedience, Yeah. right. And so if you don't submit and are not obedient, you gotta go. Yeah. Divorce. Wow. And then it's contrary to the whole plan of God. See, see a, a believer's meeting on Sunday morning, we have a corporation, because people give their tithes and offerings and we gotta pay the electric bill and we gotta buy 
stripes on the parking lot and got to keep the toilets flushing. Right. Okay, so we have a corporation, but the corporation is not in charge. Mm. The spiritual body's in charge. As soon as that corporation is in charge yeah. and the spiritual body is the tool, yeah. where it should be the spiritual body in charge and the corporation the tool, as soon as that switch happens, then the offerings are emphasized, then control and obedience is emphasized rather than love and relationship and family and the power of God, yeah. the power of the gospel. And so, so we'll market the gospel, but, all right, okay, are you following me? I'm following you. Okay, love only counts when something goes bad. Yeah. Okay, when everybody's obedient and nice and pleasant, we say, we love one another. That does, so does a baseball team, so does a football team. Yeah. Okay, but when something goes wrong, somebody violates, somebody makes a mistake, that's when love counts. Yeah. Love counted toward us as a human race because we violated, we were in sin. Love is in the messiness. Lo right. The messiness is the opportunity for love to yeah. manifest. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so see, when a church is going along, and things get messy, that's the opportunity for the power of the gospel. Wow. See, that is not the opportunity for the pastor to use uh, emphasis on delegated spiritual authority and get the rebellious people out. Yeah. See, when my kids are rebellious, I don't kick them out. No. I go on a walk with them. <laughs> yeah, let's take a walk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, okay, so let's go back to this round table. So you're, you're getting these guys together. And by the way, if you guys want a round table in your city, contact Ted, contact myself. We're going to yeah, work together yeah. on some of these. And uh, we'd love to talk to you about your city. But, but tell me, t so, so these guys come together. And by the way, everybody loves it. Okay. Because pastors are not bad. Yeah. But they've been trained. They're God's voice. They've been trained they're the shepherd. They've been trained that it's important to be correct. They haven't been trained in love. They've been trained that we're a family, but they, live, they know we're really a corporation. So see, when they come to the round tables, they celebrate because wow. they're working with the things they've always believed and figuring out a way to implement yeah. them. And they realize what they've been doing isn't working. I don't it's care not, how successful yeah. or big the church is, by and large, it's not working. Well, we need to be authentic New Testament. Yes. See, it, synagogues work. Yeah. You know, and an amalgamation of Old Testament and New Testament will work to some measure. All right. But what we want to be is an authentic New Testament believers meeting. Yeah. Otherwise, the power of the gospel is not there. Yeah. And the community mocks us. And the, the, the HBO documentary done on my story. Yeah. You can go to St. James Church, St. James Church .com, And we'll put that and, on the screen and, too. And the, the HBO documentary is there. HBO was not appalled at my sin. They know everybody's a sinner. Right. HBO was appalled that the church said it was restorative and forgiving and was so harsh. So the very See, place that's supposed to be the safest place, which is the church where people can come as a refuge for healing, has really become one of the most unsafe places in any community. Well, <clears throat> if a person hasn't said the prayer, then it is a safe place. If a, once a person becomes a Christian, especially a Christian leader, then it is not a safe place. Wow. All right, so because we reward hypocrisy, as long as people are hiding their sins, we'll reward it. But as soon as something happens and they repent, we'll punish them. Mm. If, if they're, if they're in the church, see, because we, what we sell is, if they're a prostitute, a worldly person, the grace of God is there. The, right. So that's our product. Right. And then our product is say the prayer and then you become a good guy. Yeah. So if you're a bad guy, which everybody is, right. to some measure, when you're in the church, you either have to hide it or get out. Wow. See? And so, and so there's no process, no journey. Listen, there, listen, Christian counseling centers are exploding all over the nation. Christian churches are declining all over the nation. Because you can go to a Christian counseling center, and the first thing you do is you talk about your sin. I'm, I, I burn down buildings. And the other one, I'm an alcoholic. The other one, I'm addicted to porn. 
another one. I've got horrible anger problems. And then you can be there a month or two and then you find out that guy's a superintendent of schools, that's a school teacher, that's a fireman, all that kind of thing. But you start it off with what it's gonna take for us to be sober and he healed. Yeah, yeah. You go to a local church, you know who the superintendent is, you know who the teacher is, you know who those people are, but there's never a time when the superintendent says, I like starting fires. Mm. See, and that means we miss the point. Because if the New Testament church authentically manifests in a group session at a therapist's office, but everybody has to keep up appearances in a local church and can't process safely what, what they're going through, we miss the point. Wow. Ted, we've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. Talk to the audience. Tell them, tell them where we need to go from here. Where does the church need to go? Here's where we need to go. Love is the marker. God is love. If you follow love, you're following God. Love is living for someone else's good. Mm -hmm. So to live for someone else's good, we have to be strong. We have to invest in ourselves so we're strong enough. We have the wherewithal to rescue others. And that's authentic New Testament church. Ted, it's been great. Audience, we've got to become an authentic New Testament church. Ted, we know this is just the beginning. So we yep. had you here the first time. We're going to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep, Say fine. hey to Gail and the family. I will do it. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you, audience. We'll see you soon.